Thanks for watching today. Throughout the program, you'll notice this graphic. It's there so you know that we'd love to pray with you. You can give us a call or go online. Also, this is a great way to keep in touch with us. What makes the perfect parent? Can there be such a thing? Pastor Dwayne shows how the enemy tries to weaken our families. But God's Word shows us the steps to strengthen our family lives in today's Father's Day message, The Perfect Parent. Today is Father's Day, and uh, I remember when our first child was born. Uh, it's the only one we ever made it to the hospital for. All the rest of them were born in a van. And that's why they're called Vander Clocks, because they were born in a van. You, you knew that, though, all right? So, so the first one, we actually made it to the hospital. But, like, I mean, we got there, wheeled her in. Five minutes later, baby. So uh, they, but I think we stayed there 12 hours, 14 hours, whatever it was, and they, they sent us home. So we get home, and, and uh, our son is not even 24 hours old. And, and I said to Jeannie, I want to take him for a walk. And I didn't know what to do, you know. So she said, okay, and we're living in Mexico, in Guadalajara, and Abonita de las Rosas. And so uh, I, I take little, little Joshua, and I've got him in my arms. I'm just that proud dad, and I'm walking him down the street, you know, and talking to him and showing him what's, a, what's around, not that he understood anything, all right? But, but as I was doing that, I was very, very impressed by a scripture in Deuteronomy. It's the 30th chapter, it's the 19th verse. And it says, I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life, right, that both you and your descendants may live. And I just came to a realization, never had hit me before, that the choices that I make were not just going to affect me and Jeannie any longer. The choices I made were going to affect my children and my grandchildren and even my great-great-grandchildren. They were going to affect me and my descendants. And, and I remember thinking, I need to be a better man. I need to be a better man. And those of you that, that are parents, uh, you know how it goes. You know, everything's really great for six months, nine months, even like even a year. And then all of a sudden, that little personality starts to come out. And you do not need to teach them to say, no, mine you do not need to teach them to cry when they do not get their way, right? How many of you figured that out? That's just, that's just in there, right? And, and all of a sudden, you realize, uh, I need to do something because this little kid's like a little terrorist in my house, all right? They're going to control this house, all right? So Proverbs 29, 17 says this. It says, discipline your children that they may give you peace of mind and will make your heart glad. All right? So notice the Bible says to discipline your children. And, and the word comes from the word disciple. It literally means to train. And, and you remember Jesus said it. He said a disciple fully trained is like his teacher. All right? so, so get this. The goal of parenting, if you do it right, your kids are going to be like you. Just like you. Now, that can be a very scary thought. <laughs> All right? And hopefully that makes us want to be better men and better women. Now, in, in the New Testament, in the book of Ephesians, there is an admonition to fathers. And on Father's Day, I thought this was a good place to start. It says fathers, and now I think it addresses fathers because we tend to do it wrong more than mothers. All right? I remember in, in our house, when it came time to discipline the children, they asked for Jeannie, <laughs> all right? Because she, she just had a lot more mercy than I did, I think, all right? But it says, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So as you're training them, as you're admonishing them and showing them the way they should live, it says you need to be careful not to provoke them to wrath. Now, the reason for that is this. 
if you do it wrong, your child, they, they, they close their heart to you. Right? They turn their heart away from you, and you're no longer able to be a positive influence in their life. Now, there's really only four things, main things, that, that this is talking about when it says don't provoke your children to wrath. All right? The first one's very simple. It's punishing in anger. Right? The Bible never talks about punishing your children. It talks about disciplining or correcting in love. Right? You see, if, if you wait until you're mad... Right? You wait until you're angry, right? you're not going to correct in love. You're going to punish. Right? And you're never to punish, you're to correct in love. It's because you love them. It's, you're trying to teach them there's a right and there's a wrong. There's consequences for doing what's wrong. Right? So you never punish in anger, you only correct in love. Punishing in anger closes the child's heart to you. Secondly, it's being unreasonable. And when, when I say that, this is what I mean. As, as our children get older and older, the goal is that they leave. All right? I, I know that some of them aren't doing that any longer, you know? They're 30 and they're living in the basement playing video games. Right? But, but the goal is that, that they, they grow up, all right, and you have taught them how to live, how to make right choices, and they leave and they go out on their own. All right? But what happens sometimes is what parents do is they don't ever want to cut that apron string at all. And they've got a 15-year-old that they're treating like a 10-year-old. So what you want to do is you want to be giving them, as they show themselves able, you want to give them more and more responsibility, more and more freedom. So when they hit that age, whether it's 18 or 21, whatever it is, that they move out, they're ready. Right? But if you refuse to give them more and more freedom and responsibility as they prove themselves able to handle it, what, what happens is literally your children, again, they take their heart and they turn it away from you and they won't receive from you any longer. The third is being hypocritical. Now, that just simply means you say one thing, but you don't live it. Right? You're, you're, you're telling them you do it, but you're not doing it. So in Genesis 18, verse 19, it says this, this is God talking about Abraham. It says, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that he may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Now, the Bible tells us that Abraham is the father of the faith. Right? Now, I always thought God just chose Abraham because of his faith. But if you look at this verse, it says that God chose Abraham because he knew that Abraham would command his household after him. In other words, Abraham was going to live it, but then he was going to bring his household along with him. And that's why God chose him. That's why God was able to do for Abraham what God had spoken to him. Right? So we can say it like this. Albert Schweitzer said, Example is not the main thing in life. It's the only thing. When, when, when we're going to train our children, we need to live the way that we're training them. In Deuteronomy at 6, it says, These things that I command you today shall be in your heart, and then you shall teach them diligently to your children. You can only t uh, teach your children what's in your heart. Right? They can listen to what you say, right? but you're going to reproduce what you are. Right? I think it's interesting when you talk about the purpose of marriage, if you'd ask people, right, you get a lot of different answers. You know, companionship, to have a family, to not, you know, be lonely, for pleasure. But God actually says that in, in Malachi 2, the purpose of marriage, he says, why one, why marriage? He seeks godly offspring. God is looking for godly children. He's, he wants us to take the faith that is in our heart and pass that faith on to our children, right? And the fourth thing that causes a child to literally close their heart to you is when you refuse to admit you're wrong. Refuse to admit it, right? By the way, when you tell them I was wrong, that is not when they find out. They, they, they knew beforehand, right? And everybody makes mistakes. Everybody. It, you realize kids do not come with a manual. 
You wish they did. Now, it's interesting that Jesus refers to God as a father. And so often, and we're supposed to see God as a father, but we also tend to see God through the eyes that we see our earthly father through. And sometimes that's good, but some of us have had earthly fathers that weren't the greatest, right? Some of them were abusive, some were absent, some abandoned us, were selfish, distant, and we tend to see God that way. But God, Jesus is telling us he, God wants us to relate to him as a father. And no matter what your earthly father was like, our heavenly father is perfect. Our heavenly father loves us. In fact, Jesus in John 17 is praying and he makes this statement and have loved them. That's you. He says, as you have loved me. So Jesus said, God, the father loves you exactly the same as he loves Jesus. You know, God practices what he preaches. He says, love your neighbor as your self. And God actually does it. You know, there's a lot of ways that we can miss it as fathers. Uh, I just wanted to mention one man in the Bible who, who really missed it. His name was Jephthah. And in a little history, uh, his mother was like a concubine. And the rest of the family absolutely rejected him. And, and they literally chased him out of town and said, we want nothing to do with you. You're getting none of the inheritance. And the result was that that rejection just made him want to succeed. And, and su to, to succeed, to be successful, was just a driving, driving force in his life. And when a war came, the very people that had rejected him, that had chased him out of town, they came to him and said, hey, we need your help. Would you please lead us into battle? And, and he said, well, he said, if I do this and I have success, he said, then I'm going to be the head of this entire group, this entire area. And they said, fine, fine. And so he, he goes to God, he makes a vow, right? And he said, God, if you will help me defeat this enemy, he said, whatever comes out of my house when I return, I will sacrifice that to you. Well, God gives him success. And when he comes back, his only daughter, his only child comes out to meet him. And what, what I, I want to drive home to you is this, that sometimes we are seeking success, status, position, money, fame, influence to the point that we neglect the most important thing in our life. You may have been brought up poor and you just said, you know, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be a success. I'm going to make it. I'm going to have influence. I'm going to become famous. And what happens is you cheat. You cheat someplace. Everybody, I think, cheats someplace. All right. But, but where you need to cheat is you need to cheat when it comes to entertainment, when it comes to sports, when it comes to hobbies, when it comes to friends, when it comes to work, but the place you never want to cheat your time is with your family. They need to be the most important thing. Nobody's on their deathbed and said, oh, I just wish I'd worked more. When you're looking back at your life and evaluating your life, you're going to go, it was relationships, it was families, right? Jesus said to count the cost before you start to build or you'll be considered a fool. And you need to count the cost on the things that you're doing with your life. Are you investing the time the way that you should? I tell you what, children grow up so fast and they're gone. I have a hard time believing our youngest child is 29. I'm only 33. I mean, that's what I feel like. That's what I think. I mean, time just went back, bam, and they were gone. All right. And time really is the greatest measure, unit of measure when it comes to love. The time that we spend. And again, you're going to cheat somewhere, cheat work, cheat hobbies, cheat your sports, your friends, but don't cheat at home. Don't short your spouse. Don't short your family. 
Now, back to Genesis 18 about parenting. God says, For I know him in order that he may command his children, his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. All right? Now, here's what he did he commanded, he commanded his household after him, his children and his household. You say, What does that mean? That means he made the right choices for them. He did not give them opportunity. He did not say, do you want to go to church? Do you want to go to youth group? He told them, you're going and you're going and you're going. All right. And what he did by doing that, he put them in the right places. But what he did was he taught them to make right choices. He taught them to prioritize. All right. You know, if you say, hey, it's a nice day. I'm going to skip church. We're going to go to the lake. We're going to go golfing. You know what you're teaching your children? That fun is more important than seeking the kingdom of God. That family time is more important than seeking the kingdom, right? And we need to protect our children from wrong and bad influences. We need to know who our children are hanging out with and what they're doing. Now, somebody said, well, I want my children to influence other people. And that's good. That should happen, all right? But when that happens, if your children are hanging around with somebody who you're wondering about, you're not sure they're going to be a positive influence, you need to make sure that there is a spiritual element to their relationship. You say, what does that mean? That means you need to make sure that they come to youth group. You need to make sure they're in a prayer meeting together. You need to make sure there is a spiritual element to that relationship. Now, I want to read you a little bit from Haggai. And uh, while I do that, Matt and Jake, come on up here. I'm going to use these guys as an illustration in just a moment. But it says, if one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment... And the ed- but the edge, he touches bread or stew or wine or oil or any food. Will it become holy? And the priest said no. So he says, if you've got something holy, right, and it touches something that's not holy, will the holy make the unholy holy? Answer, no. But then he says, but if you have one who is unclean and he touches any of these, the bread the stew, the wine, the oil, or the food, will it be unclean? And the priest said, it will be unclean. So he said, but if you've got something that's unclean and it touches something else, it will pervert or it will cause to be unclean what it touches. So here's what it's saying. It's saying it's much easier to pull somebody down spiritually and morally than it is to lift somebody up spiritually. Or morally. And with our children, we need to be sure that they're in an atmosphere where they're not going to get contaminated. Make sure that there is a spiritual element to the relationship. Even if that person is, is, comes from a, a totally secular home, you make sure that you put a spiritual element into that relationship. Right? And then I wanted to mention this. Do not have a child-based home. Now, I know this is going to be very unpopular, but I really believe this needs to be said. Please do not email me. I've already got some, all right? (laughs) The Bible says that seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I believe this. The devil is weakening families through busyness, through activity. None of the activities are bad, but we're just so busy, right, that we do not have family time. It is rare for a family not to sit down and even have a meal together. It's a rare thing, right? Uh, I, I see families, they're, 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 they're out of church for, for all the time because of activity, 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 all right? We've got their, they've got their kids in sports, they're in basketball, football, baseball, soccer, hockey, dance, music. They're doing everything, right? And I'm, none of those things are wrong. And I'm not saying don't do any of them. But when you get so busy, right, that you do not have time as a family, it's wrong. You, you are sowing seed that you do not want to reap a harvest from. 20 years from now, all that sports is going to be gone and the effect, the residual, is going to be zero. Right? Listen, listen to me. What you want is when your kids become adults, you want to be their friend when they become adults. Right? And the way that you do that is you train them right 
and you have family time with them. Right? And if you do not have that, the day's going to come. Those kids are going to they're going to grow up and they're going to be gone. And there's not going to be that relationship that you want. If you're staying so busy that you have no family time and you have no time to seek God as a family, to put seeking the kingdom of God first, you are too busy. And listen, culture, I know what culture is telling you. You've got to have your kids in every single thing that's going on all around you. And again, I believe that it is a strategy that the enemy is using, all right, to weaken families, all right, to weaken us spiritually and to weaken that family tie. Look, if you want, when your kids are 25 years old, for them to want to hang around with you, you've got to spend time with them now and not time hauling them here and hauling them there and watching them do a sport. You need to spend time with your children, all right? I know that's not popular, but it's just true. All right. And then lastly, as parents, I just want you to realize how fast our culture is changing. All right. It is changing uh, uh, so quickly. All right. Even three years ago, I, can, I, I could not imagine that some of the things that are going on in our culture would be happening. All right. Now, if you want your children to be pure. You're going to get no help from culture, from school, from movies, and from literature, right? Uh, in fact, I'm going to recommend to you a book, and I want it, I, I, if you're over 25, I want to recommend this book to you, I Parent, all right? I want to give you one quote. Adolescent sexuality no longer requires an exclusive relationship. Any casual acquaintance will do. Now, I, I know I'm older than many of you, but when I was growing up, right, there was a, a commitment and a love relationship, and then there was a sexual relationship. That is no longer true, right? I, I have parents, I've heard them say this, well, you know, I'm just so glad my kids aren't dating. They don't need to be dating, all right? Adolescent sexuality no longer requires an exclusive relationship. Any casual acquaintance will do, all right? The, 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 the things that are happening in our society are so different from what happened 20 years ago, 15 years ago, even 10 years ago. There is such a change, all right? And what we need to do, we need to be praying for our young people. We need to be monitoring what's going on with our young people, you know, because society is telling them sex is nothing but a physical experience. It's no different than eating a meal not realizing it fragments your soul, all right? The, the mystery is gone. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 literally says that when there's sexual relationship, you become the same body or the same slave. If you look in the Greek, the same slave, there is this transference that takes place, all right? And uh, I, I just want to encourage you, all right? Bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and be informed about what's going on in our culture today, all right? And then just one little last thing, all right? I, I mentioned daughters and sons, they're very, very different. E every time I listen to Jeannie on the phone or she calls me on the phone, I mean, she ends all her conversations the same way. I love you. I love you. I love you. We love you. I love you. You know, and that's great, all right? First Corinthians chapter 5 tells the husband, to love his wife like Christ loved the church. But then this, listen, it also makes this statement. It says, and let the wife see to it that she respects or honors her husband. All right? A woman's greatest need is love. But a man's greatest need is not love. A man's greatest need is honor or respect. All right? Now, that, that's, that's what, that's, that is what opens a man's heart. Right? I remember as our, our boys were growing up, um, Jeannie became very frustrated, right? Because what she was doing without realizing it, she wasn't giving them honor, all right? Now, you say a man's need, but, but how many of you know boys are their little men, right? I remember these, these guys, they get to be 10, 12 years old, and, and Jeannie would want to tell them what to do. She'd want to tell them how to do it and then help them. And they would just get so frustrated, all right? They just wanted to do it themselves and then have her say, oh, you did great. And they're like, that's right. That's right. I did it all by myself. All right. In fact, my, my little grandson, but he's like, when he was like four years old, his favorite thing was by myself. 
All right. So that little girl needs hugs, love, attention, affection. But that little boy, that little boy, he's looking to hear you're proud of him. Right? You're proud. He's looking for respect. Right? And you say, how do I respect that little guy? I mean, what has he done to be respected? Let me ask you a question. Now, when, when, when God says to a man, he says, love your wife, uh, how many of you know he doesn't say because she's this, that, because she's a good cook, a good mother, beautiful, because this, because of that. How many of you know you just love them because? Not because of what they do, just because. That's what she needs. Because of her innate value and beauty. And the same thing is true. You know, when it comes to a husband, I've had ladies say, well, when he does something that I can respect him, I'll respect him. No, you just begin to respect him. You can find something that you're, you appreciate, something that you're proud of, and you let him know. And the same thing when it comes to our daughters. They need that love, affection, attention, and hugs. And our little men, they're looking for respect. They're looking for honor. You know, several years ago, I heard somebody say, there's something better than going to heaven. And I thought, that's crazy. And then he said, it's going to heaven and taking your family with you. And I said, that is right. That's right. But the first step is for each one of us to be right with God. And if you're watching today, you're not where you should be with God. You need to come back. You need to get right. And you say, I want to get right with God. I want to invite you to bow your head to pray this prayer. Make these words your own. Just say, oh God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. And I believe he rose again. And I receive him today as my Lord and my Savior. I'm going to live for him every day. I thank you. You've heard my prayer that I'm forgiven, that I'm your child on my way to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Dwayne, we'd love to get you a free copy of his book, Your New Life. He wrote this book to help you continue on your journey to take the next steps in your walk with God. You can go to walkingbyfaith.tv and download it absolutely free. While online, you can purchase a copy of today's message, The Perfect Parent, in the WVF store. If this ministry is feeding you and blessing you spiritually, please consider becoming a partner with us. You can go to walkingbyfaith.tv slash give and click on the giving option that's right for you. Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there and have a great week. Life gets busy, so having everything in one place is a big help. That's why we created the Walking by Faith app. Bringing the ability to watch weekly programs, read devotionals, take notes, and give to your favorite mobile device. And with the added feature of offline listening, you can now take Walking by Faith with you wherever you go. The new Walking by Faith app.